After focusing on abnormal psychology as an explanation for the killer's motives in the pilot, Gehenna offers a more profound philosophical point of view. <laughs> The music budget continues to balloon as we get not one but two Cypress Hill tracks featured in the first scene. I appreciate that the producers wanted to generate some street cred and set the mood, but this gang of hardcore drug users comes off looking a little silly listening to the censored version. An unlucky member of the crew has a drug-induced freakout and gets mauled by what appears to be the devil. After finding out in the pilot that his family is still being stalked, Frank installs a floodlight, or at least tries to in between answering questions from his nosy neighbor. They are really lampshading Jack's creepy interest in Catherine, by the way. What is the name of what she does again? She's a clinical social worker. Frank is saved from banal suburban banter by the bat signal. The group has found a case in which some gardeners have found a charred ear among the ashes in their garden. Peter Watts has already ruled out the obvious culprit of Dennis Hopper, and with no other leads the group turns to Frank Black. Frank theorizes that the killer is burning people alive and spreading their ashes in the garden. At home, we learn that despite Frank's best efforts to keep her in the dark, Jordan knows at least a little bit about what he does. Is he working? Yes. Catching the bad man? The group finds seven adults worth of ashes in the garden, meaning this is the work of a serial killer. The group's forensic pathologist mentions how lucky it is that they found the ear, especially since they're able to pull traces of LSD and dry cleaning fluid from the tissue. Peter and Frank trace the dry cleaning fluid back to the warehouse district where they find a set of human teeth. An analysis of the dental work techniques reveals that some of the teeth are Russian. The group brings in Mike Atkins, an old friend of Frank's, who Frank has turned to for help in his own stalker case. Mike tells Frank that he doesn't think that the photographic stalker is going to escalate and that Catherine is not the target. Frank is. What's the object of terrorism? Terror. That's all he wants at this point. Then he's a success. The group identifies one of the victims from the teeth, and the kid's parents mention that he was part of some secret MLM cult. The group reads a letter from the victim, renouncing his family and all of his worldly possessions. There's a lot of religious culty nuttery in the letter, but it does mention the word Gehenna, the title of the episode. Apparently the cult believes that the apocalypse is coming a lot sooner than we thought, thanks to some bad math. Frank spooks everyone by bringing up the possibility that the thing that got a hold of this kid is supernatural. Somebody powerful got a hold of this kid, that's for sure. Or something. Back in Seattle, Catherine gets spooked by someone lurking around the yard. But it turns out it's just Bob Fletcher, Frank's old police department friend. It scared me half to death. Fletcher and Catherine have a tea party and talk about Frank behind his back. And it's here where we see one of the weak points of the show with Megan Gallagher struggling to do anything with the ponderous dialogue they've given her. He was paralyzed, Bob. Not by fear, but by something much deeper, by understanding. It feels like the writers didn't know exactly what they wanted to do with Catherine while they were setting up the show. Stuffing her in the fridge would have been cliched even in 1996, and being stuck in the role of concerned wife would have been a waste of Gallagher's talents. So it seems they split the difference and just had her do a little bit of both. We do get some insight into her character though, as she mentions that she's aware of Frank's psychological burden and how she doesn't want to add to that. So she puts on a happy face. You can't stop it. I want you to make believe that I can. We get our third song of the episode from Black Sunday, indicating that these guys really like their Cypress Hill. As in the opening of the episode, the gang drops off one of the weaker members of the sales team, apparently in a ritual sacrifice. Except this time, Frank Black is there to make the save. The kid is reluctant to talk to anyone, but when he does open up, it's the usual story. Sacrifice everything and give complete loyalty, and you'll share in the power when the time comes. The kid then dies on the spot. Mike Atkins says that it's from LSD, but Frank thinks that it's out of sheer fright, fear of what is seducing and killing these men. This conversation between Mike and Frank deepens the lore of the show, asking one of the burning questions, what is the nature of evil? I've always believed that evil is born in a cold heart and a weak mind. Catherine tries to offer her own advice, and we see that making her a social worker was a good idea, as her argument is grounded in psychology and sociology, rather than religion. It's a good counterbalance to what Frank is seeing. I just think the language has changed. 
I think science and psychology have given us a clearer idea why people commit evil acts. But I can't help but feel that this sounds more like two people reading from a philosophy textbook than two people who are married to one another. Yes, it's smart. That's not the problem. The problem is the writers frequently struggle writing the pondersome without making it ponderous. This is especially true in the early episodes, with characters just speaking soliloquies about philosophy or outright dumping exposition on us. In the end, Catherine comes up with a pretty Camusian idea. What would I tell Jordan? Maybe you should just tell her goodnight. You're probably not going to answer the question of where evil comes from, and it may not even matter. So just hug your child. Mike Atkins calls late at night and tells Frank that the boy's skin and fibers had traces of sarin gas. Frank and Mike briefly touch on the real-life death cult, Am Shinra Kyu, which released sarin gas in a Tokyo subway in 1995, and would have been a hot topic during the conception of this episode. During the conversation, Frank just happens to be asking Jeeves about Gehenna, and he finds an offshore holding company that has a concerning interest in industrial chemicals, the kind you would need to make sarin gas. Mike makes the ill-advised decision to investigate himself without telling anyone, and he gets locked in an industrial-grade microwave. Thanks to a tip from Frank, the group manages to pull Mike out before he dies, but the radiation damage has been done. During interrogation, Frank continues to see the devil and the cult leader that they caught. Catherine reminds him of the countless number of people that he saved, but Frank is still perturbed by the idea of evil everlasting. And we're out. Gehenna is an interesting episode in terms of atmosphere and theme, but it's a muddled mess when it comes to plot and execution. The cinematography remains fantastic after an impressive debut. If Chris Carter likes Seven, he certainly captured that feeling. Obviously, since this is the 1990s, you have to put up with some bad special effects. The thematic elements about whether humans are responsible for our own evil were a welcome departure from the crime procedurals that were flooding the TV landscape at the time. But unlike later prestige TV, where these moral and philosophical issues would be played out by the characters' decisions, in these first few episodes it's mostly about reactions and having conversations. It's very much telling instead of showing. And part of that may be the 44-minute format of television. There's just not enough time to get into the philosophy while also having a murder mystery. And the case they're trying to solve may be the weakest part of the episode. Sure, a hyper-capitalist pyramid scheme death cult that executes its lowest earners by nuking them in a giant microwave sounds interesting, but there's not a whole lot that we see that separates it from an actual Salesforce spoiler room. And it doesn't help matters that the death cult is arrested off-screen, and the cult leader doesn't even say anything. He's barely even a character. It's mostly just a MacGuffin to introduce the idea of determinism into Frank's worldview. We'll continue to explore whether the devil made him do it, or if Johnny just doesn't play well with others.